Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today we welcome back a special guest and a friend of the channel, and that is Marin Katusa. How are you today, Marin? My pleasure. Marin's one of my uh, investing heroes, and that book on the shelf behind me, I often talk about the Cold War. I know plenty of you guys have read that now as well. So today we're going to be talking about the commodity space, uh, the oil war, how it all ties into what's going on in this financial landscape, and how those um, resource-dependent countries are probably going to get hit a lot harder by this global slowdown. So, Marin, do you want to maybe give us just a very uh, brief overview of what you're seeing recently in the commodity space and sort of how it's changed in the recent weeks? Well, this oil war combined with the coronavirus, they're, they're all accelerants for what's going on in the market here. They're not really the cause for what's going on. It comes down to what we've talked before about FTDs, financially transmitted diseases, and the lower rates and, and just the bubbles going on. But let, let's let's first focus on the oil aspect and, and what the knock-on effects of that are. Okay, so you have Russia, you have the OPEC, Saudis basically using this as an opportunity to flex not just with OPEC uh, geopolitically that they can now really knock out Iran and the regime of Iran because they are directly to eating into the Iranian market share in China. That's something the media isn't really talking about. Iran's been really, really quiet, but they are on their knees. So if there is ever a point that that regime could topple, this is it right now. The people have seen that the administration has followed this whole coronavirus, and now with Saudi just pumping an extra couple of million barrels, that's going to eat into the Iranian a market share of oil into the Asian markets and slap on all of the extra tariffs put on. So they're really in a tough bind. What about the Russians now? So let, let's talk about what type of oil production. Uh, so the Russian wells are very different than, let's say, the Saudi Aramco production. When you go and look at the Guahar complex versus the Russian, uh, the Ural uh, production, the Russians are not swing producers and, and, and they can't just turn on a million and a half or shut off a million and a half barrels like the Saudis can. So this is going to sound crazy and I'm going to get a lot of hate from this. So the, 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 the trolls love to come out and take, take, take things I say, uh, but the Saudis production is actually much more vulnerable than the uh, Russian production because of that aspect that so much production is concentrated in one area. You go to the Russian side of the onshore, uh, th there isn't one facility that's concentrated as much as the, the Guajar region. It's like 45% or 50% of all the production, specifically when they kick into the swing production status. So you got that play going on also. So the benefactors of that is going to be China, India, the importers, the Asian markets. Uh, but then you got the LNG knockoff in effect. So th there's so many aspects here. The Chinese pulled off the force majeure on the LNG. Uh, Qatar is going to really now, nobody's talking about the LNG wars that are going to start and have started between Qatar and, and the Russians. And that's a whole new dynamics going on. So there's a lot going on here. Yeah, and for people at home, uh, LNG, liquid nat natural gas, uh, we are catering for an audience of beginners through to experts here, Marin. But I want to um, dive into what you said there. So a couple of things. You, when you're talking about swing producers, you're saying it's very easy for the Saudis to turn off half of their taps and say to their shift workers and whatnot, you know, you guys have got less shifts this week. It's very easily for them to swing production higher or lower. Is that sort of generally what you're referring to? They've historically been a, per, a swing producer because if you take the Guajar, it is such a big, such a rich uh, facility deposit that it's not like the American shale producers that is so well dependent. It's a very different type of deposit, different geology. So mm -hmm. it's concentrated in such a small area, but we're talking about facilities that produce, you know, 50, 60, 80,000 barrels a day per well. Whereas you go to some of the regions in the Urals and the Russia, it's five to 10 barrels a day. You go to places, a, a really good shale well in, in, the, in, the, in Canada or in uh, the US, you're looking at, you know, 1200 barrels is, is phenomenal, but you got these massive decline rates. So, you know, most of them within the end of the year, four or 500, if it's a solid well, that's barrels per day per well. Um, so it's a very, very different type of swing production. And, and there's this misconception uh, I want to, again, just like I talked about when our last time we spoke about the currency advantage that the Russians have. People forget about the pegs that the Saudis and the Chinese have. But when you look at the Russians, uh, they can produce, let's say, first of all, they have a fantastic 
uh, don't underestimate Putin. And it's not because I wrote in this book. I'm a Canadian. I don't work for the Russians. I'm not Russian. I don't have citizenship there. I have no interests there financially or anything. But you have to respect what they're doing here across the commodity index. And they produce in rubles. And the ruble is going to depreciate. And they're selling for the U.S. dollar, which is going up higher respective to their currency. So you look what's going on uh, from the uh, currency crisis. Do not forget that the Russians can take economic pain better than any other nation, specifically better than any other Western developed nation. We're going to see what Europe's going to go through here. Italy is the time machine on that. And sadly, what what is happening in Italy is going to spread across Western Europe. It's horrible, but Europe's shutting down. So the, it's almost as if the Saudis and Russians have figured this out ahead of time from the markets and are actually being proactive for their own market share. Yeah, and I think the example I might have even given in our last interview was um, people at home tend to understand the gold example in Australia, the gold producers, they sell their gold in Aussie dollars. So even if it collapsed 50%, you know, they're back to $1,300 an ounce gold, which isn't too bad as where they were a few years ago. So the other thing you said there was uh, Iran's on its knees. So what's their cost per barrel and why is that the case and how is all that playing out? So the Iranian production, unfortunately, they haven't redevelop, uh, reinvested into their existing production. So the Russians have, the Saudis have, the Kuwaitis. When I went down to Kuwait, you wouldn't believe. they. The, people forget that. It's actually Kuwait has the lowest cost of barrel production, not, not Saudi Arabia or Russia. It's Kuwait. Um, it's just a much smaller region. And then the second lowest is the, the, the region right between Saudi and Kuwait. It's like a shared region. Um, the Iranians are much more gas oriented. A lot of people forget that. And you look at what's happened with Iraq. So there's that tension there. And, you know, you, Iran has really just had a rough 30 year patch. And they're following the trend of more like Mexico, the Cantorell Basin, where they didn't reinvest into their big, big areas. Um, Iraq tried to do that in the Kirkuk fields when I was in northern Iraq. Again, it was very expensive because when the money was flowing in into refills, that was when $80, $90 oil, Halliburton, Schlumberger, it, it was very expensive to re-drill and all that. When, when oil's down now, they're not definitely not reinvesting into their fields. On top of that, they're relying on aging infrastructure and they're not replacing that production curve. So the Iranians are in a very, very difficult place and they cannot compete because of the, the, the balancing the budget. So if you look at the Saudis, yes, they, they, they planned at higher, you know, their budgets were planned at, I think, north of $60 oil, but they have a lot of reserves that they can dip into to weather the storm out. The, the, the Iranians don't have that. And, and also the, the Russians, um, if you just look at their fiscally, uh, the government, they don't have the debts that the Canadian government or the uh, American government per, per, per person or GDP, they're about 20%, uh, which is much lower than any other developed nation in the world. They can last that $35 oil for the next seven to 10 years. And, and people will hate that comment, but it's Russia. It doesn't matter. The Russian oil fields, again, are not swing producing areas. They can't shut down the thousands and tens of thousands of wells that produce five to 25 barrels a day. It's irrelevant to the Russians. It's going to be an R between their currencies. So you look at where Iran is. Iran is going to be the one that loses the most in this trade. Yeah, and so again, let, we'll talk about coronavirus and the economic impacts of that in just a second. But you just said that um, you know Russia can survive at thirty five dollars a barrel because their their cost is production is so low. How does it play out though for the U.S. shale producers, Canadian car, uh, tar sands, these other guys with higher costs? Is one month bad for them? Is three month disastrous? You know, six months a year the defaulting on all that junk bonds, all that debt they've issued. How does that play out in your mind? So I've been writing about this for a long time, and, and it was just in May that I said we're, we have no oil investments, and, and I, you know, I, my book is essentially about energy. And for a guy like me to have zero energy at that time, uh, it tells you that I was very bearish on the markets, and that's what I've been writing to my subscribers. So I wrote down, you know, the the debt wall I called it, and we went through every single publicly listed company and, and private that has bonds and, and that you could track their financials, and I called it the debt wall, and we, and we broke it all down and, and what price and who's going to be in trouble, and. At the time, I said, these guys are going to extend and pretend, right? Like that's the phrase in the debt world that they use. Yeah. And I said, be careful on this because so much private equity money was chasing yield for their shareholders. Now you get the redemptions. So much triple B is really B, B minus at best, the junk, junk, junk. Uh, 
but it doesn't work at $35, $40 oil. It just doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. So let's break down the shale guys. You have their declines. There's certain areas that will do okay at $35 oil. And remember, technology, it's getting better. They've been, they're lowering their costs, but at $30 oil, you're not going out and, and doing much exploration. You're going to hamper down and focus on your best areas and maybe focus on refracts. It's something I talked about a few years ago. A lot of people haven't figured out that you can actually go in and optimize your best wells with the technology. Now let's shift over to the north in Canada. Uh, some of the, uh, the the gas stuff is garbage. Stay, stay away from that. I've always said that for years. But let's talk about the oil sense. So like someone like a Suncor, um, they about a decade ago merged with uh, Canada's largest gas refining company called Petro Canada. It was a spin out of the country from the Trudeau days. They merged it together. So Suncor can survive better than anyone else because they're vertically integrated. They have the refining capacity. They're like a Canada's mini Exxon. Um, so, but what about the other guys? Well, the big costs for the oil sand producers are up front. At that point, the OPEX, you know, it would go about, I, I think, Ford Hills, the, the newest project put online between Suncor and Tech. You're looking at 35 to $40 oil, but you get that Canadian advantage in the currency that I talked about again. So we've seen the dollar go to about $1.37, $1.38. I think it's going to be $1.40 here shortly, meaning the U.S. dollar is going to get stronger. But Canada has the disadvantage that we didn't permit these pipelines. So that currency advantage, some of that is taken away by the cost to get it to the markets, right? So there's that aspect too. Essentially, not as much production is going to come offline initially in the first month as people expect. Second month, same thing. Now, if this stays here for the next six months, then you're going to be looking at some serious uh, debt defaults. How are you going to refinance that? And then it'll be a very different game. But for the next... 30 to 60 days, I, I don't expect very much production to shut down because, you know, what are the what what are the debt guys going to do? Do they want to put on the boots and go run an oil well? That's the last thing they want to do in, in the world. So they're going to, you know, extend and pretend that that's the name of the game right now. Yeah, it, it's just so crazy watching this all play out. But to tie it all together for people at home, I think Russia are seeing this as their opportunity. They've paid down their debts, as you said, um, I'm not sure if their record amounts of gold stockpile gives them more confidence to the tune of $100 billion or something like that. Do you think they're seeing this as right now's the time that we can really crush a sector that can possibly start a house of cards scenario in the US junk market if pensions then have to sell that debt and this turns into a um, spiraling GFC? So you would not believe how many media outlets have asked me to come on on, on Friday. That someone was like, please come on on Monday. And I, and I just said, guys, Everyone thinks that Putin and Russia has this sinister plan to, to ripple and defeat the American markets. Russia's just doing what's best for Russia. And MBS is doing what's best for Saudi Aramco and his nation, okay? So they look at this opportunity and they've seen that, you know, we've talked about it, the OPEC members, uh, they've been cheating on, on the shoulders of the Saudi cutbacks. But now Saudi Aramco is a, you know, a pseudo public company they have shareholders that they have to report to they got to start thinking long-term strategy and, and some of these countries haven't been following the lines the saudis are also going to bring discipline within its own fraction of opec and if it can take down uh iran which is not a friend to the uh saudis russia and iran have a long history but you know the russians will kind of go with it at this point because it's in Russia's best interest because they increase market share also. And MBS will reignite his importance to the American geopolitics within the region and globally. Again, that's another aspect here that's going on. I want to get your opinion on that uh, raise. I think it was Saudi Aramco that went public and was it 10 or 20% of float at a $2 trillion valuation? Is that sort of like what we're seeing in the unicorn space and it was just that does that mark the height of craziness in the bubble? Did you invest in that? We or do you wrote, think it's way we, overvalued. We, oh no, I, I did not invest in it. And we wrote an article said like, is this ringing of the bell on the top, right? Yeah. And think about how much capital has been sucked out into that. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it a unicorn. I'd call it unicorn valuation. But like, guys, let's not forget that this is the now largest. I guess you can call it publicly traded. Uh, even though it's controlled by the Saudi family uh, company in the world. Like th this is the most valuable company in the world because of those assets. Um, but there's no doubt about it that, you know, the, the company, the, 
the family took a lot of money off the table there. And it's a small, I think it was less than 5% of the value uh, of the company. Mm -hmm. But that's the first step, right? So, you know, we've seen historically when I published on this and said stay away from it, you've never seen these state run, you know, pseudo public companies ever trade at the valuations of their peers or the, you know, the private, like the publicly, uh, like a Chevron or Exxon because they're not really publicly traded companies. They're just listed companies for bond reasons and other aspects for, for the for the state-owned enterprises. So um, yes, that was a, if you look at it, it was directly a ring at the top, but for everybody watching this and, and you're looking at the valuations that we're going to get, please don't try to catch a falling knife. I've been writing about this for now seven months, preparing for this. Don't try to catch a falling knife. I've been doing this for 20 years and I've rarely ever picked the bottom of a stock. Let the safe fall, bounce around, and you will be able to go pick up the safe, the cash that comes out of the safe when it's wide open on the floor. That's what you want to focus on. And this is an aspect to really upgrade your portfolio, to go from you know the speculative stuff that you're looking for four to five times your money where you can now get dividend paying stocks that you're going to double or triple your money within 18 months because as difficult as this will sound, this too shall pass. The coronavirus will pass. And this is giving me and my subscribers an opportunity to buy some of the most disciplined, world-class assets at valuations that I'm, I'm salivating at. You just need to be patient. And I call it the, the way of the alligator. And this is what we've been waiting for. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I recommend everyone read that uh, alligator stalking article about how to buy stocks. But I mean, a lot of our uh, audience are pretty familiar with uh, cryptos and not catching a falling knife, <laughs> waiting till that uh, bottom has been found. It's very similar with uh, low cap in particular energy stocks. So let's dive into the coronavirus. And um, I know you're not, uh, well, actually, were you a Dr. Marin or what was the, what was your background there? I, I am not a medical doctor. I'm a math guy. So um, I'm look, thinking one of your my hospital stories. Yeah, well, that doesn't put me in a good space here with this virus. Uh, um, but one of my subscribers, a good friend, uh, he's in my club here, and uh, he's one of the head guys for Canada's uh, agency, equivalent to CDC in the U.S. And so I wrote a thing to my subscribers in the uh, third week of January saying he thinks that this is different. And that was part of the reason why I put out a uh, take all our profits I put out a Katusa free ride on many of our positions because we were doing so well. We've had such an incredible year. And I said, guys, with what's going on, start taking Katusa free rides and, and take all your principal off the table at a minimum. Play with the house's money. That's fine. But sell enough that you can go to bed and, and not worry about it. And that was in February that we did that. And it was because of what my subscriber was telling me. And I republished what he wrote. And we've been following it that way. Uh, if you look at the curve... That, that, you know, Italy has, and you see where Spain is, Spain's next up, France is next, Western Europe over the next seven to 10 days is going to have a, uh, unfortunately, a medical apocalypse from an economic standpoint. Uh, Conte, the, the, the Italy just put out like 10 minutes before I came online, they're shutting all non-essential services. That, that means mm -hmm. restaurants, coffee shops, and if you know anything about the Italian culture, shutting down a coffee shop is a big no-no to their way of life. This is serious for the Italians and the hospitals are overburdened. Now from an American standpoint and Canadian, people are still saying this is just the flu mm -hmm. because that's exactly what the Italians were saying a month ago. Then you see where it goes. Um, all I know is that the economy is saying that this is real. It's been the catalyst, not the reason things are correcting, but it's been the catalyst for people. And and I think what hasn't hit yet, imagine if Trump's going to go on TV tonight in two-hour time from this taping. So today's, what, what is today? Thursday 11, in Australia, yeah. yeah. And uh, he's going to go on, and you know he's going to give relief. And he's basically going to skip QE from to the banks. He's going to go direct to the small uh, small businesses, give loans, give uh, stay-at-home quarantine relief. But at the end of the day, the economy, you know, is 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 telling you that the share prices that it's going to get worse. And when these money managers and speculators start seeing it at home, it's going to be a slow grind. So things, in my opinion, from a stock market standpoint are going to grind slower. It doesn't mean they're going to have rebounds up and down and up and down. And this is a great opportunity for investors, speculators to pick up value investing. Like I'm going to give you a great story. So one of the biggest, 
private wealth management firms in the country. I went to know one of the directors well. He tried to pitch me because I've done well. He got a bunch of cash and we were at a dinner party and he said, you're, Baron, you're crazy having that much cash. He was reading my stuff saying, you, you think this market's going to correct? I go, I think it is. And he, he was trying to pitch me on what to do. And he's like, Marin, you know, you got to just get in there. And, you know, you, you have no debt in your life. That's insane. You should. And I go, for what? And his belief was to make more money. I go, to do what with? Like, I don't want a mortgage. I don't. That's the whole point to have money is so you don't have debt. But everything's upside down for this money management business. And it wasn't like get into blue chips and, and, and yield because there is no value there at these prices. And they were pushing down the value chain speculation because these these are what I call the one percenters. They just make fees off you. They have no skin in the game, right? And I said, this guy's insane. Now that this whole culture in the money management business has been by the dips. There hasn't been any true fundamental analysis. There is no real number crunching. And, and this guy is not some schmuck. He was representing one of the biggest money management firms that you have to have a certain large size before they'll even take your account. He couldn't tell me the EPS. He couldn't tell me insider ownership, insider cost base. Didn't know the name of the president, all these factors. We're talking about like if you're going to be putting up dough or recommending something, skin in the game and due diligence, that is going to reset. And, and because things have been so good and buying the dips has worked, it's like a turkey just before Thanksgiving. It's good until it's not, right? And that's where we are in the markets. And I don't think this buy on the dip is is where it's at. I'm looking at buying fundamental value, be patient, and, and upgrade your portfolio. 100%. We've had people like Steve Keen, uh, Roger Montgomery is a value investor fund manager in Australia. And these guys have been just raising their cash levels because fundamentals have gone out the window. And we did a video the day before the market tanked called Global Asset Bubble, The World Has Gone Mad. And it was literally that blow off top where everyone was getting these you know, zero fee trading apps and you're reading on Reddit about these college students getting rich buying Tesla and this, that, and the other. Like, it was just like, shut down. Oh, anyway. <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting thing though. The U.S. market has only been shut down seven times in the history of America. And uh, and what if Trump went so extreme? Let's just say this market, a bottom would be Trump puts a, uh, a coronavirus safety risk shutting down the market. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but this market is going to, we're going to see things that would be like a Twilight Zone episode because from the same standpoint, I think you would agree with me that value investors like what I, I do We've been looking at this going, this is insane. This is like a Twilight Zone episode, negative interest rates and all this stuff. But that became normal and the pendulum is going to swing back. And, and you know, when I go to these dinner parties and, and these well-to-do money managers, they laugh at me with gold. They, they think that I'm from, you know, the 1800s and this barba barbaric relic. Uh, but they're the ones with the mortgages and they're the ones with, you know, a borrowed financial lifestyle. Uh, reality is going to come back and it's going to come back hard. Absolutely, and we will uh, get to gold later. But um, you've sort of coined this term uh, quantum economics and negative interest rates and, and whatnot, and that is going to be the response. But I think it's it's almost like a momentum play that once that ship turns, there's so many people that are on the other side of the boat, uh, whether it's gold or just um, you know this momentum investing and all the algorithms, I think it's really hard to turn around. You can't just say, oh, we're going to do $40 billion a month of QE. I think you'd need to do enormous injections to try and keep the markets afloat and they don't have those you know um, bullets in the chamber for interest rate cuts so what are your thoughts around the uh, quantum economics as you call it look the ftds are like as i've been saying people for a year people are like whatever Marin. you know it, it well we see it in the american economy like it, it, we just had a 50 basis point cut you know 50 another 50 what does it change nothing you know the market wants one point well the market's telling you that that's not going to work either um the, the French president just came out and said, well, we're going to put, we've agreed to 25 billion euros of stimulus. Okay, well, that's less than 1% of the euro uh, GDP. What's that really going to do? Nothing. Like, what about 50 billion? Well, that's less than 1.5%. What about, you know, 200 billion? Is that, no one knows the number because it's a black hole. And that's the whole point of this quantum economics theory that I had, that you're going to see things that have never happened before and really the, the solution for the governments is going to be trying to keep things the way they are, but stimulus, which means lower negative rates. And unfortunately, 
the average person or the people who've done well from that, unless you understand what's going on, the government is slowly stealing your wealth away. It's almost like a repatriation of assets mm -hmm. or of wealth. And that that's the only solution that the bankers have. Like the European Union, Lagarde, she is going to do whatever it takes to keep things moving forward. And what, you're going to tax people more? That's not going to work. We've already seen austerity measures don't work. What other metrics do they have? They're not going to create a new currency out of thin air, uh, nor do they want to bring gold back. So gold is going to be the response to that because gold brings discipline. Gold's like the truth. Nobody likes the guy at the house party who's telling the truth. And that's what gold is. Gold's like that reality check. And the governments don't like reality checks them. and people are shocked when i say this but the government of canada we are we're, we're like australia we're for you know commonwealth country uh, we're resource rich and think about we have no gold in our vaults in our vaults the government has sold all of our gold so that's the last thing someone like trudeau who's you know his goal is to be a you know essentially a global socialist there you don't want gold reality but the market will take it as a reality just like negative interest rates, it doesn't make any sense. Gold will be a response to that, and you don't have that negative carry trade anymore. Remember, when Bor Warren Buffett came out in 2011, famously said, you know, it, it's what it's a shiny 70 foot by 70 foot by 70 foot cube, or 70 meter by 70 meter, that's all the gold in the world cube. You can look at it in shiny versus all the stuff, plus the carrying cost. Well, you don't have the reason for his biggest uh, knock on it, which is, you know, the interest rate aspect. Now when interest rates are negative, the real rate, gold is actually a positive carry. Just don't show off about it. It becomes very discreet. It's going to be, you know, you want to have discreet wealth now. Mm, absolutely. If they're in this dichotomy where if they try and push up uh, the stock market with these injections, then that does one thing, but that doesn't actually fix the real economy. And if you try and target the real economy, it's who do you favor? And if you start bailing out the oil sector, why shouldn't all the cafes in Australia that serve all their avocado and toast and that they aren't going to have any customers and tourists? You know, where do you, who do you choose who to bail out? That's the headache they've got. This is why it's not going to work because <laughs> so let's really work this through and, and you look at, you know, uh, the stimulus as well, you know, the governments are going to put all like in Canada here, uh, ESG funds. Uh, I, I was one of the largest financiers of green energy because it was so cheap and hated. I was on the front page of our largest national newspaper talking about just the, the cost of capital and the yield play and how this made sense. A three and a half dollar stock went to $22 at that point. The economics, it's not value investing anymore. Like it became expensive, so we sold it and we moved on. But you have so much money going to this ESG and feeling good. And that's initially where the money is going to go into the feel good and the socially correct aspects. But once that reality check comes in, there's going to be a lot of mistakes. And, and the government has very little experience in practical management. Will there be a day where the central bankers of America and Europe and Canada and Australia start acting like the Japanese, where they start buying uh, assets and ETFs? That is a very realistic opportunity, uh, realistic uh, situation. And they're not going to start with the mining companies because it's not friendly uh, from, from the government standpoint. It's not politically correct. It's not feel good. It doesn't keep them in power socially. Uh, look, man, I, I've been involved in a lot of mining companies from the ground up, founding them from Canada's third largest producer. And people just generally don't like miners. And it's this historic thing in most regions. Now, there's certain areas that do, but you're going to expect, be very careful where you're putting your money in, in, in resources, because the one thing a lot of these countries are going to do is like, I don't believe in peak oil. And I've been talking about this since 2008, that it made no sense. But what you can expect is peak government stupidity. And they're going to increase the taxes on these foreign companies who invested billions of dollars. And they're going to slowly try to take away the wealth of these companies and, and use the excuse of the locals that this is our wealth, not the former. And, and I get a lot of hate on people going, well, you're a capitalist and, you know, you're stealing wealth. Okay, well, what about, you know, the discovery process, the investing process, the operations process. And we've seen what happened to Mexico and Venezuela and all these different countries that, you know, repatriate, like basically nationalized foreign assets. That's not a solution either. So things are going to get pretty rough. 
I had a uh, conversation with someone the other day who referred to AK-47s as the Venezuelan credit card, but uh, that's a story for another time. Um, the move to renewables, how does that relate to what's going on at the moment with these low oil prices? Um, is nuclear coming back into favor? We've got a lot of people that are very interested in uranium, and it's just kind of been bottom bouncing the past couple of years. Do you think that renewables are now um, you know, economically viable? Is there an incentive that, you know, this ESG that, uh, theme that we're uh, hearing all the time? What are your thoughts on all of that? Look, every green project is in, it's just like a mind, like I've been saying this for years now, 10 years, every green project is independent. Like what's the uh, the, the power uh, contract that they have, uh, the PPA, purchasing power agreement, uh, where, what are the risks, what are the costs, what's the transmission line loss, all these different aspects. So yes, you know, a lot of green energy has been and continues to be economic. Like look at the, the, the price cost decreases in solar and and wind, it's become economic. But then you got to look at just like how the bond, the price of the bonds have been exploding, but the yields going down. A lot of people can't comprehend that concept. We've seen an incredible, incredible rush into the green energy companies after the bust of 2015. And, and they're not cheap anymore. And people are chasing that yield and the mandate of these new funds. How many hundreds of billions of dollars have gone into these ESG funds looking for something that, you know, is the mandate, let's call it, which is, you know, the green energy aspect. Um, ironically, you know, nuclear is the ultimate green energy, but it still has that stigma. The, I call it the Homer Simpson or the Jane Fonda effect with this China syndrome. Yeah. It's not yet there because it gets clumped into uh, mining. It's like the, the, the radioactive mining. So subconsciously, I, years and years ago, I, I took a tweet of myself holding bunch of yellow cake in my hand you wouldn't believe the comments that came out it doesn't come down to science like what you and i would focus on it comes down to perception and emotion and it's a religion for a lot of people so the uranium sector still has a long way to go again i i still hold the cut to kill strategy that saudi and russia is doing right now in oil the russians have deployed the same strategy with the kazakhs for uranium so the australians and, and the canadians and the americans that's a tough situation for them because they have incredible assets, Russia and Kazakhstan, and they've had foreign capital that they can, what I call, renationalize. On top of that, they have a weakening currency that they can really flood. So, you know, Kazataprom went from essentially less than a million pounds to over 65 million pounds in less than 20 years of production. They are the OPEC of, 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 uh, uh, of uranium, but they don't need 12, 11 other uh, countries cheating on them. They are. OPEC. Uh, then you look at the enrichment capacity. Russia has 55% of the world's enrichment capacity. So that, mm. that's what Putin has done is he's really positioned himself strategically. Um, Trump has been moving it forward, but it's very slow. But there's no need for a new uranium mine uh, in Canada. Like, even if Trump brings in, you know, some sort of package where the DOE says, okay, we have to buy, say, 5 million, or what, what did I come up with in my publication, about 7, you know, say 7 million pounds. That's going to be all domestic U.S. production. So if he comes up with, say, 100 million pound, $100 million of relief a year, uranium's, call it 20 bucks, 25 bucks, 4 to 5 million pounds a year, there's no need for any uh, Canadian uranium in that. So there's going to be a lot of reality checks in uranium. And, and I will say this, you know, silver investors are gold investors on steroids, but uranium speculators are a different breed. Boy, when I say that, do they hate me and they send out like comments. But people have to remember, I've been doing the uranium sector for almost 20 years. And I am one of the largest financiers in the uranium sector. Just be careful what you own. Um, it's going to be a long haul. And uranium is not going to forty dollars anytime soon. That's and I've been saying that for like three, four years now. Particularly if we see this uh, demand crunch from the, the global recession or whatnot as well. Um, for the, time. Yeah, for, for those people at home, I'll link the video down below. We did explaining uranium and uh, some bonds as well. How does uh, Obama's policies and, and Trump's policies, um, just quickly for people at home, what were those policies on on fracking and what were the policies, uh, current policies towards uranium from Trump? So look, Trump is Republican. 
drill, baby drill. That goes back to the Bush days. So in 2010, when the Gulf of Mexico uh, BP disaster happened, they basically shut down the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, but regardless right now at $35 oil, Trump has said no more uh, SPR, so no more uh, sales of reserves, but that's a small relief. Um, that's a short-term Band-Aid solution. There's not much Trump can do in this situation because of where America's gone and, and not all oil is equal, okay? So what the Saudi type of oil and where the Russian type of oil, the Euro price versus the Saudi price versus the WTI price, uh, you're going to see um, a lot of the offshore production. You're not going to see like any drilling on that. Why? Like it's not economic, even if they hit a, a beautiful well, the Halliburton, the Transoceans, the Schlumberger's, they're telling you right now, look at the share prices. Those are, a, they're already below the global financial crisis prices. And the debt that these guys have been carrying on their balance sheets, that has to be refinanced and at what price? And, you know, the, these are all questions going on. So, you know, Obama took a very green uh, standpoint and you look at uh, where Trump has taken it, it, it he, he's in a serious predicament here. And uh, for the next four to five months, we're going to see the real American cost base, which not much of it makes money under $40. That's the reality. Um, just off the top of your head, Marin, it's okay if you don't know. Do you know who which ETF has more oh, energy sector? Can you got me or? How's that? Is that better? There we go. That's better. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, that. the... The HYG ETF or the JNK, the junk bond ETFs, do you know which one of those has got more exposure to the energy sector? Because I know a lot of people are looking to short some of these junk bonds. Yeah, the HYG has got a lot of it. So, be you know, uh, if, if again, if you're going to be playing that game, that is not a uh, buy and hold strategy, whether you go long or short in this market, that it's changing so fast. And the only thing I tell people is in this type of market, do not play on margin. I have seen, I remember in 2009, a very well-known uh, player in our industry in the resource sector got caught on margin and he was a very close friend of my partners and I saw front view and this is a guy who built up incredible net worth in 30 years and committed suicide because of the margin aspect. Uh, don't play with margin in this game. Uh, 100%. That's the only thing I see. You can be that's right, guys. You can be early. You, we can have a big dead cat bounce that wipes you out. Don't don't do that if you don't know what you're doing for sure. So let's get into gold. Even if you do, even if you do know, don't play with margin. It's going to catch a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Let's jump into gold and silver, Marin. I know you're fairly bullish on gold. Um, you definitely have an interest in the mining space as well. You, you spoke about already that you want to scoop up these opportunities once we form some some bottoms and whatnot. I know a lot of people are really bullish on silver and they talk about this gold to silver ratio, but I've kind of come across to this camp where I think silver is being used less as an industrial metal or less as a monetary metal now. So I do think that that, that ratio isn't necessarily a straight up buy signal. I think we still need to be cautious. So I want to get your thoughts on silver. I've said that for years. Uh, I always use the example and it's very different, but in 2000 and was it 10? because I was very early in fracking with Quadrilla and a few other deals, a lot of the established guys, players, is always use the six to one ratio that the SEC accept on a, you know, oil to gas value because of the energy uh, ratio. And it worked for many years. And I said, fracking changes that. And we saw the gas go up to almost like 85 to 90, very similar to what the silver bugs are saying. And I've got lots of buddies in the silver game. Keith Newmeyer, what I think it's like the third or fourth largest silver producer in the world. Ross Beatty is a very personal close friend of mine. He's the chairman and largest shareholder of the world's second largest silver producer. Uh, he created the company. That metric just doesn't hold anymore. And people go back to, you know, the 1500s, even go back to the Roman days where, you know, at one point it was two to one that you could fund a, a soldier with an ounce of silver. And today you can't even buy a you know, a fancy caf, uh, cappuccino at Starbucks with it, but it's changed. The use of silver's changed and it comes down to the cost and it's a byproduct. 
back in, in, in the historical days, you know, you think about poor free production and the recovery costs and, and, and all these different aspects. And with the evolution of digital cameras and the uses of silver changing, and also the improvements in the solar. So people are like, yeah, but they're not using it for cameras, but look at the solar sector, it's gonna use so much more silver. But then you realize the, the Murphy curve. Uh, I'm with you on that. It, it's kind of stuck between a uh, monetary metal and an industrial metal. And you know it doesn't know which one it is. Uh, again, it comes down to um, what your time frame is. And if you want to do silver, you'll eventually, I think silver will have a bigger run than gold because of how it's priced and, and how the market will react to it eventually. But gold is, you know, I always use that paraphrase. I don't know who came up with it, but gold is the currency of kings and silver is the currency of gentlemen. And there's just a lot fewer gentlemen in today's world or the world understands gentlemen a lot less today. So you're going to be uh, patient with silver. Yeah, I'm still bullish on silver. If gold goes into this multi-year bull market, I think percentage term, silver's probably still going to perform well. But then if you're looking at the silver stocks, it's very much about fundamentals because we've seen a lot of those companies have to raise capital over and over again in the past seven, eight years. Well, you nailed it right there. So please look at the financials. And, and, and we just sold it. We made 80% or 78% on Pan American. And granted, I sold it a little bit too early. We would have pulled a double, but... I like being conservative and if you got a big gain like that in less than six months you lock it in but let's take a silver producer like pan american it's been doing it for 25 years you know in the early days that company almost went bankrupt a few times now today it's a solid has over eight thousand employees it's a solid solid company but people forget that it also produces over half a million ounces of gold um, be careful with one mine companies be careful with debt because you know, so many of these silver companies actually have, you know, high cost production because it's a pure play silver mine. Whereas so many of these copper mines, uh, for example, let, let's take something like a pebble. Pebble would become one of the largest silver mines in the world. And the silver makes up less than 2% of the cash flow of the mine. That, that's the new paradigm that silver investors have to realize with, or more importantly, management teams of silver companies have to compete with. So what about gold? How bullish are you on gold, Marin? Um, you know, for the beginners at home, you're one of the people that always says, you know, buy some physical, do your research, uh, and then go for the miners. Uh, are you not a fan of the ETFs? I think GLD is held in a trust by uh, one of the biggest banks. So you're not a fan of those sort of ETFs or your thoughts on that? Sector? No, I'm not. Uh, so let, let's break down. So you have the ETFs, you have, you know, the GLD, which is kind of like paper gold, so it's very liquid, it's fast action, but you're paying that fee. If everybody should have physical gold and silver, I've been saying that for a year, don't show it off, don't put it on your coffee table, but have some. Secondly, depending on your age, we're in our prime right now, and we can take a little bit lower risk, but there's companies out there that are, let's say, 700, 800,000 ounce gold producers. Equinox, uh, again, I'm referring my friend, uh, Ross Speedy. I, it start, the company started in my office. I'm one of the largest shareholders. It went from zero ounces to over 700,000 ounces in less than four years. Now, I'm not trying to promote it. I'm just telling you the facts. Today it trades at less than 0.6 of its NAV. There's no risks now that will the mine put into production. When when I started financing, all these trolls were saying, "Oh yeah, look at Marin. He's going to try to do this. He's whatever." Well, we're there and producing now. A guy like Ross Beatty has put up over 150 million dollars of his own money. He's the chairman. The guy is a winner. Christian uh, Milau, who's the CEO, and Greg Smith, who's the uh, president. These are really smart, invested guys that I talk to all the time. I'm in the trenches. If there was someone better, I would have my money with them. They are the go-to guys and they're trading at 0.6 NAV. So many of these producers are trading at, you know, two times NAV, like Barrick at its recent high was trading just under two times its NAV. That's its net asset value. Well, you have something like Equinox trading like a development story in a normal market at 0.6 NAV, but they're producing over 700,000 ounces of gold. Uh, that's a good start, a place to start. Then you have the smaller exploration stuff. I've been telling people for a long time that the market has changed. Uh, a lot of the boomers who used to fund that market is, is really gone. 
And I don't like taking that type of risk. So we don't have any of that in our in our portfolio. Uh, I like more advanced assets that are cheap. I love bringing new technologies to old assets to kind of revitalize or look at it within a new light. That's really where the biggest money has been made in the sector. Now, if you're lucky enough to get a Voices Bay or, or a, you know, a grassroots discovery, but it's been so rare. And I published a chart, it's free on our website, basically the last 50 years of exploration budgets versus ounces found and pound, ounces of gold found and pounds of copper found. The industry is still spending a lot of money. Like last year, the gold sector spent $4 billion US looking for gold and no tier one a tier one mine is anything over 5 million ounces um, that can produce over 500,000 ounces a year have been discovered. No tier two deposits were found. Tier two is 3 million ounces or more uh, that can produce 300,000 ounces for 10 years. So you're looking at like, it, people think, wow, there's no discoveries because they're not spending money. No, they are, but it's it's a fragmented industry. So the, the investors want to see less GNA, less companies, and that's where it's going. So um, I don't see the junior market taking off in the way because so much money has been managed passively than ever before, and they need liquidity. And take a company like Equinox, you know, it's got a two and a half billion dollar market cap today, but it's still a junior to one of the big passive funds. It now, you know, these guys want to see it get to a million ounces, which it'll get to it by the end of next year, and then it's a mid tier. So the whole paradigm in the gold sector has changed. Uh, two years ago, I wrote an article called The Commonwealth Takeover, how the Australian companies were traded at a better premium. And it's just logical that they're going to start coming to Canada and buy out the Canadian companies. That's exactly what we've seen. Uh, some of the Australian companies are so smart, run by super young, uh, aggressive guys like Northern Star. That, that's a team to watch. They're going to grow their ounces in the ground by buying out other companies. So you want to look at it and go, OK, what's the value of this company? This management team are tired, they're old. This other team will come in and take it over. And, and that's the game right now. Uh, investing in a geologist with a box of crayons with a $10 million market cap with the hope of finding a gold mine, that's not where my money is going right now. And my performance has dwarfed most people's because of that strategy. Yeah, um, Northern Star and Evolution have been two of the stocks in my portfolio that have given like crypto-like returns, as we say. But um, why why are those net asset values trading you know, at point six? Is that we've seen the GDX really lag? It's, it's so much different to the Australian companies that are powering ahead. Do you think that investors have been burnt and they've seen all these rallies that fade? They're just not convinced they need to go into that sector. Are these companies paying dividends and that's going to be more attractive to these funds to try and get a bit of a yield? Is is the picture changing for GDX? Those sort of indexes and mining companies. So GDXJ, which actually uh, changed its mandate, so it used to be you know, uh, companies that are looking for gold and up to, I think it was like 300,000 ounces a year of production. About a year and a half ago, it changed its mandate to include million ounce producers and a minimum of like a 500 million market cap. So that wiped out, there's a whole rotation. So the GDXJ is really a GDX mid-tier companies. It, it went down 10% today. Uh, gold still 1640. Uh, it's liquidity crisis. That's why the equity stocks are, are the equity, like the gold miners are not reflecting the value in gold because the market and the passive funds are going, all right, I need liquidity, sell. They're not looking at it going, oh, this is gold, so it's going to do better. It's just seen as another stock in another sector. And, and gold, like I've been writing about for a long time, like we saw in the 08 crisis, Gold so sells off also in a liquidity crisis. Gold performs incredibly well in a solvency crisis when people re need, really need assets and something to back it up. That's when you'll see gold get a real bid. The markets are still waiting to see what's going on with this coronavirus, what type of stimulus. You know the governments are going to stimulate more now than ever before. And then gold will gradually get the bid. It's going to start flowing. And then you'll see... As that starts picking up momentum, then it'll flow into the gold equities. That's why I'm telling people to buy in tranches. Do not try to catch a falling knife. Gold equities are still in the liquidity sell-off phase. 
Yeah, and I think the daily chart the other day showed this perfectly, and it's two different types of investors. We saw the huge sell-off in gold and gold stocks uh, when the market crashed, and then the following day or the one after, we saw this big bounce back, and that's the, the guys that want exposure to gold that aren't worried about the liquidity crisis, the different group of people to those that are getting margin calls. Just quickly, Marin, are you in the camp that we've reached peak gold or a long way away? Technology and all that is going to... No. So a good friend of mine, he was the founder and chairman of, at one point, the world's largest gold company. His name's Ian Telfer. He's the guy who kind of coined peak gold, and he wrote an article, and I sent him a note going, Ian, with all due respect, I think you're wrong, and here's why. Um, it comes down to cost. We've seen that peak oil doesn't exist in, in, in oil, nor do we see it in, in uranium. Uh, a lot of people said that in 07, peak uranium, and blah, blah, blah. We've seen where that came out. The gold also, uh, if you look at areas, it comes down to um, cost. And there's a lot of gold, tons of gold that will be delayed due to permitting, but there's no shortage of gold. It's just at what cost will it come in, right? So uh, if gold stays at 1800 for, say, two years, then you'll see much more type of porphyry projects copper that has let's say like a 0.3 5.4 copper with a 0.4 gold that doesn't quite work at 250 copper and 1650 gold but you know the gold economics definitely make that mine work at 1800 and there's a lot of big big porphyry gold copper deposits out there um like pebble or ttrb uh, Nova Gold's got a couple. Yeah, Tech has one. There, there's a lot of assets out there like that. Um, so I do not subscribe to peak gold. There's peak debt. Remember, there's peak debt for these companies. That's what I want everyone to focus on because debt will be crippling for the resource sector. Just, just quickly, is that something? I'm not sure if your views on Bitcoin have changed, but one of the things I tell people that are gold bugs that when you have that eight hundred eighteen hundred dollar an ounce gold or that extra production comes online, it's the opposite for Bitcoin when price goes up and we're actually approaching that halving where supply drops. Is that something to you that goes, oh yeah, that's a, that's a pretty bullish argument? Or what are your thoughts around Bitcoin and possibly any other cryptocurrencies? I, I think it's a very logical argument. I, I don't play the crypto sector. I put a bunch of money with a good friend of mine. And I got in trouble the last time I said this for U.S. regulatory reasons, but I'll say it again. It was uh, Mark Hart and uh, my buddy Worth Ray. Uh, they're very smart guys. They've done very well. Uh, sorry, lawyers, if I'm not allowed to say that. Um, but, you know, I focus in my niche and I know what my niche is and you know, for me to run with guys like compete against guys like you in crypto, I don't have an advantage. My advantage is the resource. My Rolodex is I can phone any president of any of the mining companies that I can get to site within a day and I have an advantage. I don't have an advantage. I only play sectors where I have a strategic advantage and I have no advantage in crypto. And to those guys, your mates, are they running a mining company or are they running like a fund where they pick the cryptos for you? So Mark Hart runs a fund. Uh, he's, he's at a Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, and whatever they do, I just support them and they're super <laughs> smart guys. No worries. So I guess I wanted to tie it all together now, everything we've spoken about, um, you know, cycles and, and debt and how bad do you think the, the, the crisis is going to be and how how bad is it going to be for those developing nations that are really reliant on commodities? A mine site's site's going to get shut down. Is that going to dramatically reduce supply? Or do you think this all kind of blows over and it's not too bad? Or do you think it gets really bad for a lot of these nations that are reliant on resources? Look, take someone like Iran, I think it gets really bad. Uh, someone like Nigeria, which nobody's really talking about on the market, uh, I, I think it's going to get pretty tough for them because they did not balance their budget for $35 oil. On top of that, Saudi's putting them in line because of what they've been doing on the cheating. What about, uh, you know, there's so many of these countries that have, Mexico is a perfect example. Like They didn't expect this. Um, the debt is in U.S. dollars, and, and it's wild. Because I'm a, you know, referred as a gold guy, people think that I have to hate the U.S. dollar. And I've been saying, well, no, that's not the game. It, it, the U.S. dollar is going to do well. And there's going to be, you look at the rewind of the petrodollar and what's going on here right now with, with the U.S. dollar relative to the Aussie and to the euro. We get it because we see it in a different standpoint. But so many Americans are like, the U.S. dollar sucks. Okay, but what happens to a 
uh, company, an African nation that is really debted in U.S. dollars and they can't refinance that debt. Well, if they default on that, that actually sucks out more U.S. dollars. And, and what do you replace that debt with? Well, they're going to now try to increase taxes on other companies. Well, that works as a Band-Aid solution. But in the long term, we've seen that every nation that has done that ends up like Venezuela is a perfect example. People forget what the, the battle with Chevron. Venezuela is the, actually has the largest oil reserves in the world. Granted, it's very heavy, but they don't have anywhere near the complex that the Canadian heavy oil has because what they did to Chevron, no one trusts the country or the government to respect that foreign dollar. And what happened? You know, they had a nice little run, but it all went to social causes, not reinvesting into the development of their assets. So it, it's this is not going to be a quick V recovery. I believe this is what I call an L recovery. You see a big drop and it's just going to grind out and you have the demographics against you. You got all these boomers who are going, well, you know, maybe I won't speculate on a new house or maybe we won't, you know, buy our son or daughter a, a home. Maybe they can move into our basement or we'll buy a dupe. Like everybody's going to start downsizing. And the L recovery, I believe that all this QE that is going to be, you know, all these forms of stimulus, it's not going to be enough at the stage that we're at. Um, it's going to be whether there's debt jubilees in certain sectors or certain countries, um, or let's take Italy, for example. What are they going to do? What is the euro, the ECB going to do when the Italian government says, we've been shut down for 30 days? What do you want from us? But of course, the ECB is going to have to do a debt jubilee or some form of a hybrid uh, stimulus or a, a, some sort of, we, we don't even know what's going to happen now, but hmm. what can they do? It's yeah. not going to all fall apart. And a lot of the investors I speak to that are saying it's just the flu and they've changed their tune from V-shaped bottom to U-shaped bottom, but I don't think they're still grasping this reality that this can drag on uh, for weeks or months. And, and after that, I'm very bullish. As you said, I want to uh, deploy that cash I as agree. well. Especially the US election. Let's not forget the November election. Uh, Trump will do everything in power. And, and it looks like Biden, and I know this is a US-centric concept and we're talking about the global economy, but you know, you do kind of have to focus on what's going on in America and China, and then you can get to the rest of the world. But, you know, Biden is, you know, 77 years old, and he's the face of the progressive Democratic Party in the US. It's kind of ironic in itself. Trump is going to shred him to pieces in a in, in a debate if they both get to that point. The wild card is Hillary jumps in or something happens. But Trump is going to do everything in his power to stimulate the economy. I think this next 60 days is going to provide incredible opportunity. And rather than speculating on non-revenue uh, companies, if you're going to play that lower end of the chain, make sure you're buying incredible value that will get bought out once this thing settles out. There's some great non-cash flowing companies that have incredible assets that I think are going to get bought out. I have that whole list of which companies I think is going to get bought out. But this is a chance over the next 60, 90 days to buy incredible yielding companies that are top tier yielding you eight to ten percent and those will come back and do well i'm with you 100 percent on that and every smart person i've spoken to is looking to sit in us dollars to weather the storm i know a lot of you guys are at home as well um in terms of that shopping list uh, marin does have that newsletter he's been kind enough to give us a, a big discount and for our members i'll share a link in our group with an even bigger discount again so thanks so much for that marin um and any uh, final words I think this is going to be uh, shocking for a lot of people. You, you nailed it. We've been talking for a while about, you know, it's just a flu to, oh, no, this is serious. And I think it quite hasn't hit the North American markets yet that this is not just a flu. Um, once that kind of comes and people start, you know, people in North America still don't know someone close to them that got infected. Well, the Italians sure do. And once that hits That'll most likely be the bottom of the U.S. markets is when the big traders and, and people start seeing people that they know firsthand die. That's kind of the canary in the coal mine that I'm looking at for the bottoming out of the market for this, you know, uh, for the companies that are on my hit list that I want to buy. So I think we're still about 30 to 45 days away from the real effects, the knock on effects of the coronavirus working through the North American market. 
You do have the risk of the second wave. Remember, the Spanish flu had its second wave about six months later. A lot of people forget that's a big catalyst for the reason the, the Germans, uh, many of their soldiers got wiped out. Uh, I, there is the risk that that comes in towards the election in the U.S. in November. Nobody knows yet. I have no idea. But there's a lot of potential black swans out there right now. Absolutely. I think that's been a fantastic uh, discussion, Marin. I really appreciate you uh, giving us some of your time, and we'll have to do it again in future. You bet. Cheers, guys.